thanks to Caroline and Heather for inviting me. I'm really excited to chat for a few minutes with you about um, aquatic macroinvertebrates. I've spent the last several years really focused on Michigan's inland lakes. So um, I do a lot of works on aquatic plants and invasive species in our lakes and so forth. Um, but my background is all on rivers and streams. Um, I did a, a master's at Notre Dame where I looked at stream invertebrates and how they were um, impacted by land use and sediment problems and subsequent stream restoration and how they indicated the recovery of that stream. And then for my doctorate, I, I focused on uh, rivers in central Michigan, um, looking at their fish community and physical habitat there, and also looking at how disturbance influence fish communities. So um, it's fun to come back and, and think about rivers and streams. Um, my first job after grad school was for the Huron River Watershed Council in Ann Arbor. I was their watershed ecologist for four years. And during that time, got really involved with their Adopt-A-Stream program. And so I spent a lot of time doing exactly this kind of thing. Um, working with volunteers, um, getting them prepared to go out and do biomonitoring on uh, the tributaries and the main stem of the Huron River. It was a lot of fun, a lot of excitement. And um, since I moved on to MSU, um, I focus more on lakes, but ever since I've worked at, at, at the Huron, I've been involved with MyCore. Um, I uh, worked on developing the protocols for monitoring um, both lakes and streams, and um, it's exciting to be thinking about bugs again. So um, for the next few minutes, I'm not going to take up a ton of time, but I just want to provide a little information on some of the kind of fascinating aspects of aquatic insect life. Um, and, um, you know, I've, I've taught a lot of volunteers about this. I also taught aquatic entomology, um, study of aquatic insects at MSU for our undergraduate program. So um, I'm going to wrap all the cool stuff from those uh, courses into the next 15 minutes. And the idea, um, one of the ideas behind this is to maybe give you a little insight on how these bugs live their lives and um, that will make it maybe easier for you to find them. Um, because a lot of that is tied to their aquatic habitat and the way they've adapted to, to life uh, in, in aquatics. So um, let's, uh, let's take a look here at some of the fascinating things about aquatic insect life. Um, it all starts with reproduction, right? So um, that's kind of the surprising thing that a lot of people, when they first realize that many of the insects that they're used to seeing on land and flying around actually have an aquatic juvenile stage. And that's the, the stages that we're looking for for most of these groups. So um, the midges, the little tiny non-biting gnats that we see everywhere and are very, their larvae are very common in our streams. They're kind of a great example of a, one of the typical aquatic to terrestrial life cycles that we see with insects. So um, you have your flying adults here, the little tiny gnats that fly around and like to fly in your face. Um, and then those mature adults will um, lay their eggs on the water surface or near the water surface and then they'll drop into the stream. Um, and then those hatch into the aquatic larvae that we see. Um, you're probably familiar with the bright red colored bloodworms. Um, that's just one group of the midges, uh, the Chironomidae. Um, these are most likely to be found in areas with low oxygen. So more of your mucky kind of silty streams will have a lot of these um, more bright red um, aquatic larvae um, that we call bloodworms. And they're bright red because they have a compound that's like the hemoglobin, hemoglobin in our blood that helps them circulate oxygen, even in oxygen poor environments. Um, but if you, uh, you know, there's many, many that don't exhibit this red color as well. Um, these larvae will then um, uh, evolve into this pupa stage that you may see floating around in some of your samples. They just kind of float on the water surface until it's time to emerge. And when those emerge at the water surface, you get another generation of flying adults. Um, the next thing that I'll, I'll talk about is a, is a little bit different um, life cycle that's uh, represented by the mayflies, which of course we see lots of those around here, both on our inland waters and on the, on the Lake Michigan. Um, again, here's your familiar aquatic adults or terrestrial adults, uh, mayfly that we see. 
And again, laying eggs on the stream surface or near the stream. Um, but they um, will then hatch into what we call a nymph, not a larvae. And we call it a nymph because they don't go through a pupa stage. So they don't have a cocoon or something like we see with the, with the midges. Um, they'll spend time, uh, depending on the species in the stream as aquatic nymphs that actually look quite a bit like the adults. Um, nymphs are, are, are famous for that. They look a lot like the adult, they just don't have the wings. And then um, mayfly uh, nymphs will emerge as the uh, subimago first. And that looks a lot like an adult, but they actually have one more molt to go. Um, and they'll molt one more time after they've hatched. I've actually had that happen on my sleeve before. Um, you know, you're out on the on the shoreline and, and these uh, mayflies are hatching. They'll land on any potential surface, including you. Um, they'll, they'll shed a skin one more time, leave that on you, and then <laughs> they're adults and they go looking for a mate at that point. So um, those are a couple of the, the common life cycles that we see. Um, there are a few aquatic insects that are um, aquatic their entire lives, uh, and that includes some of the beetles and true bugs, but most of them have a terrestrial stage as well. So let's look at habitat and think a little bit about how living in a stream can be kind of challenging for um, an insect. So um, current is a big issue, right? So having the stream moving and that force is always against you. It's like if you lived in, some, in a wind tunnel all the time, there's, you need to adapt to that because you're going to spend a lot of energy just trying to stay put. Um, and so the same thing is happening to our invertebrates. So, you know, some invertebrates, their approach is to lay low. Um, and that's what we're seeing here. So this is a water penny beetle larva. Um, they are called water pennies because they look like little coins. Um, they're smaller than pennies, but um, they, they're almost like an armadillo and they'll just be really flat up against the uh, stone surface or the substrate there. Um, and that way the water just flows right over the top of them. It doesn't knock them away. Um, some of our mayfly larvae, like the one you see on the right, that flathead mayfly, mayfly nymph is also very flat. You can see, you know, it almost looks like it was run over by a steamroller. Uh, but that was is their adaptation. They lay low and they stay low enough that they're actually the force of the current doesn't um, remove them from the substrate or stones that they're hanging out on. Um, another way to stay put is to hold on really tight. And that's what our black black fly larvae do, the um, simuliidae. Um, that you see here, there's a bunch of them attached to a rock surface. Um, and they have down here at their tail end, they have a little circle of tiny, tiny hooks. And those tiny hooks they use to hold on to the, um, the surface. They'll hold on to little filaments of algae or onto the, the stone itself or onto the, onto the dirt particles to hold on. And then their heads actually stay up in the water current. And we'll look at that in a minute more closely, but they have uh, ways of holding on tight. And that lets you think about when you're out there with your net and doing some sampling that you may have to, you know, definitely do some disturbance of the stream bottom to get those invertebrates to uh, come loose. Another thing you need to do in your habitat is hide, right? So um, most of these invertebrates are prey uh, for something else, either larger invertebrates or fish. Um, amphibians uh, will eat invertebrates as well. And so, um, you know, they'll either hide in, in amongst the, the stream bottom material and the plants and the wood. So again, another reason to be thorough in your sampling. Um, or they may build a hiding place like these case building caddisflies that you can see here in this image. Um, you know, building a case for itself. Um, the invertebrate is actually about this long. They look kind of like a caterpillar, but with some longer legs here at the front. And they build this case. And the cases are actually useful for identifying what kind of caddisfly you have because each caddisfly um, genus or family builds their own kind of distinctive shape of, of case. And they use the materials around them, so it really helps them camouflage themselves as well. So this is just one example. There's many kinds. So it's always good when you're looking at your sample and picking the bugs out of it um, to look for that twig that seems to be crawling around on its own. Um, that's likely a caddisfly in its case. All right, the next step of um, living in an aquatic habitat for these insects is finding food. 
So here's our black fly again, and, and, and a horrifying, you know, electron microscope photo of its head. And this is the part where you see, we've seen this image before, um, this end is hanging on to the substrate, and up here you've got uh, the head that's up there in the water column and water flowing by it. And the black flies have these intricate fans on either side of their head, and they're using those to catch any kind of particles or food bits, algae, plankton, whatever might be flying by, and it gets snagged in those fans, and then they can bend them down uh, towards the mouth and nibble on whatever good stuff is there, clean it off, and then up they go again. So that's how they're gathering food without having to move around. They can stay put right on there, right there, um, not get swept away, and let the stream bring the food to them. Caddisflies do a very similar thing, but they have to build a net. So this is an example of a, a caddisfly um, that doesn't build a case, the hydrocycids, which are pretty darn common. And this nice uh, sketch of the tiny net that it will spin, um, making silk basically, like many other uh, invertebrates do. And um, it uses that net to catch things that are floating by. And then it'll crawl out of its shelter, nibble on the tasty morsels that have caught on its net, spit out anything that's just fouling the net, and then uh, go back and wait for its next meal to arrive. And I threw in a, an interesting picture here on the left, which is actually an image of the nets that are woven by different species of caddisfly. Um, and the first thing you might notice is that, is that the mesh size is different. Um, and that's a really interesting thing because as you might imagine, if you have a stream that's really got a lot of silt and sediment being carried into it. If you're a caddisfly that weaves a very tight net, um, it's gonna fill up with silt all the time and it's not gonna be a good habitat for you. And so the species that, that weave these very fine mesh nets typically aren't found in muddy streams or streams that get a lot of erosion or sediment in them. Um, what you tend to find is caddisflies that will uh, weave these larger mesh nets um, that don't get clogged constantly. However, if it gets silty enough, you won't have any caddisflies at all because they can't effic efficiently eat using their nets. And of course, there's some that are predators. Um, and you were asking about what your, what your favorite invertebrate is. I do have a soft spot for the Helgramite, this guy right here. Um, they are very efficient predators. This is one has actually got the head of a stonefly in its mandibles right here. Um, they are um, very effective predators on smaller invertebrates. Um, uh, the water striders we often see, um, they are predators as well. Many of the, and that's a, a type of true bug in the order Hemiptera. They have this sucking mouth part that they use to pierce their prey and, and suck the juices out. So um, they're actively preying on things, um, as does this toe biter, another true bug that will um, hunt um, smaller invertebrates for food in the, in the stream bottom. And of course, dragonflies, okay, these really are my favorite. Um, the whole group, the dragonfly nymphs are, are a fascinating group, dragonflies and damselflies. And they tend to kind of sit and wait for prey to come by. And um, if you've never seen the, um, the jaw structure on a dragonfly nymph, it's pretty fascinating. This is actually um, an extended where the jaw has been pulled out. The lower jaw can actually shoot out and drag prey, you know, uh, unwitting prey that's wandering by, um, pull it into its mouth. So that's what's going on here. Here's a, a larvae that's got their lower jaw retracted and it actually comes all the way back to here. And then when it sees prey, it lowers it and then shoots it out and drags the prey back in. And if you're really passionate about invertebrates and, and dragonflies and, and you get into identifying them down to species, um, the shape of this lower jaw can help you identify them. You can see this one's got a really flat lower jaw. This one is, is scoop shaped. Um, it's, a, it's a very helpful um, characteristic for identifying which kind of dragonfly you're looking at. And then of course, as adults, um, the feeding structures can be very different. Now we're, we're above the water, we're terrestrial now. And there's many of our um, adult uh, aquatic invertebrates when they are terrestrial and adult, they don't feed at all. Um, mayflies do not feed as adults. They are on a singular mission to mate and lay eggs. Um, they don't even have a functioning mouth or digestive system as adults. Um, and the Dobson flies are the same. The Dobson fly is actually the adult of that Helgramite that I showed you before. Um, that very efficient underwater predator does not eat as an adult. 
Um, the opposite is true with our dragonflies and damselflies. Uh, as adults, they are very effective predators, as many of you know. They are, you know, people love them because they learn that they eat mosquitoes um, and gnats and they, they catch their prey on the wing, uh, flying around and um, actually holding their legs in kind of a basket beneath them and swooping around and snagging um, flying, um, smaller flying insects in the basket they make with their legs and then enjoying them after that. Another challenge that our invertebrates uh, face in the water is getting oxygen. Um, how do they breathe? And so there's a lot of different ways that uh, different invertebrate groups get oxygen and they are very closely tied to um, uh, water quality in streams. Um, as you may know very well, um, the cleaner the stream, the colder the stream, the more oxygen uh, is in that is dissolved in that water and available for invertebrates. Um, as streams warm up, and as they start to carry um, a heavier silt load, as they start to slow down, so warm, slow, um, siltier streams have less oxygen. And so um, that's where stone flies, like we're seeing here, um, are really good indicators. They get oxygen primarily um, by diffusing um, oxygen. It gets diffused or absorbed through their skin and through the little very thin and very um, um, uh, basic um, kind of furry looking, hairy looking gills that they have, at, some of them have at the base of their legs. Um, they're very primitive gills. They're not very efficient. Diffusion is not a very efficient way of getting oxygen. So as soon as a stream starts to become polluted, too warm, slows down, um, you'll lose your stoneflies because they can't get enough oxygen through their very basic mechanisms. Um, you'll tend to see um, bugs that are a little more efficient at getting oxygen. Um, these are mayflies, another example of a group that has very obvious gills uh, along the sides of the abdomen and the shape and appearance of those gills can be, um, again, indicators of what species you're looking at. Um, and so they use these gills and if you have a, a live mayfly larva, a nymph in a pan, you can often watch those gills because they're constantly moving. Um, and, and that's moving water across that surface of the gill, um, allowing them to get more oxygen more efficiently than a stonefly can. So they're a little less sensitive to declines in oxygen than stoneflies are, but they're still fairly sensitive. And then um, another way to get oxygen is to rely on surface air going up and getting air. And so that's what a lot of our aquatic beetles will do. Um, you'll see in these, in these pictures, you can see carrying this bubble around kind of on their tail end. They'll swim up to the surface and basically grab a, a supply of air from the surface and they will swim around with it like a little scuba tank. And so they don't care if the stream is completely polluted, has no oxygen, barely in it at all. They don't care. They can go up to the surface and grab air, um, oxygen from the air. Um, plastron is another example, and that's what um, these beetles that are quite common, the elmid uh, crawling beetles, they actually hold a, a supply of oxygen underneath their, um, uh, their carapace there, and so they have a little scuba tank as well. They don't have to refill all the time. Um, other invertebrates will also rely on siphons and tubes and different kinds of basically snorkeling equipment. Um, this is a mosquito larvae and here's its little tube that it uses. You'll often see these hanging from the surface of a stream um, uh, by their tail ends and that's because they're breathing um, air and not getting oxygen from the water. And maybe you can see this guy here. Um, this is a water scorpion hanging down um, and it's uh, related to things like praying mantis and walking sticks. Um, and they have a siphon that they have on their tail end that they can use to breathe oxygen from the air. So these are these bugs will be much more tolerant of pollution. All right, that's it. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that little kind of whirlwind cruise uh, through some of the interesting adaptations that our different stream macroinvertebrates have and um, that it gives you a little more insight into their lifestyles, which will help you find them and, and, and uh, be more efficient when you're out there doing your monitoring. Um, and I'm happy to take questions, um, either being able to, you know, turn on your mic and ask or typing things into the chat. And of course, you're welcome to reach out to me. There's my email address there at the bottom too. If you have questions, you can ask me. And, and of course, Caroline and Heather are very knowledgeable about the invertebrates as well. Uh, I have a question, if I may. Sure. I, I guess it's been since last 
fall. <laughs> but when I was looking at your stonefly images, I was I started to wonder if I might be misguiding identification for myself and my students at times with mayflies. I've never really had that thought before, but there's one um, stonefly image in particular that I was like, ooh, ooh. So I just wanted to <laughs> bring that up and ask. Back up? Did you want to look at it again? Was there something? Yeah, I guess. So besides, you know, I I think of mayflies, three tails, stoneflies, two tails, right? That's the big identifier. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I think that's it. I just needed to work through that in my brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's typically it. There is um, there are a few mayflies that the center tail is really really short, and so they can look like they have two tails instead of just three. Um, another thing to look for, and I know you have to get in there kind of close, but um, stoneflies, in addition to just having two tails, they'll also have two claws on every foot. Um, and mayflies just have one. So they have a, stoneflies have a pair of tails and a pair of claws, um, while the mayflies do not. They just have a single little claw on the end of each. Oh, that's, yeah, you might that's super need cool. Your, your handle ends to see that, um, unless right. it's a big one. But, um, and then what you'll also see, not in all the stoneflies, but in a lot of them, they will have these tufts of gills at the base of a lot of, of their legs. That one has it, that one has it, this genus doesn't. Um, while yeah. mayflies, their gills are all on their abdomen, not on the... Okay, the excellent. Yeah, I think it was the gill mention that made me think like, oh no. Uh, stoneflies <laughs> have gills? Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they so look thank a lot you. different. Yep. Joe, is it also true that stoneflies usually have more pronounced antennae? Usually, yeah, yeah. The mayflies tend to, most of them have have finer and maybe a little bit shorter antennae, while the stoneflies tend to, the ones we have around here, tend to have more prominent antennae. So yeah, that's another kind of thing you can kind of catches your eye when you're first looking at them. Absolutely. I got a question in the chat about um, distinguishing New Zealand mud snails from other snails you might find. They're tough. Um, they're really small, so that helps. Um, and you know what I, I tend to do, I, I've actually, to be honest, I have never found a New Zealand mud snail in the field. Um, but I haven't looked very hard. Like I said, the last few years since it's become a problem, I've been working more in lakes than I have in streams. Um, and so, um, you know, there are some, some really good resources online, um, especially through the state of Michigan to help you identify those. And um, Oakland University has put together a little tip card. I think I gave some to Heather um, on how to identify them and, and tell them from others. So um, I'm probably not the best person to give you tips for the field, but you know, you definitely want to be um, alert to any small snails that you see in the stream because that, that could be something worth looking a little more closely at. Hi, Joe. Rod Rebant. Hi. I'm curious, do you have a favorite textbook or um, a reference for macroinvertebrates? Yeah, and if you don't mind, I'm going to step back and I'm going to disappear because of my virtual background, but I've got a book on my shelf and I want to show you, so I'm going to grab it real quick. Thank you. Okay, this one right here, um, and actually I'm going to turn off my virtual background for a sec because you're not going to be able to, um, if I hold up to the camera, it's going to disappear. Uh, da -da, there we go. So right here, um, Freshwater Invertebrates of North America, uh, a guide, and the author is Voschel right there, Reese Voschel. Um, you can get it, you know, Anywhere books are sold. Everybody just says Amazon, but you know, there are other places to get books. But this is a really great reference and um, has really good descriptions. And also, let me show you. It's not very big, so it's, you know, easy to keep with you in your pack or whatever. And then it's got really nice drawings of the different invertebrates and um, descriptions of, of kind of key characteristics. So yeah, A Guide to Common Freshwater Invertebrates of North America by Voschel is a really nice field guide. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Well, thank you so much um, for having me today, um, everyone, and, and thank you for your volunteering. Um, we're uh, really excited, you know, I'm, I'm continuing to have strong involvement with the MyCore program and, you know, always interested in feedback from both program coordinators and from individual volunteers about, you know, what resources we can provide and how we can support the great work you're doing because as, as Heather and Caroline already mentioned, this program is vital, both locally and on the state level and beyond. Um, we watch the use of our database where all of the data gets entered and um, it's actually really um, amazing uh, the number of people that look at that data and are interested in it. everything from teachers using the data in their classrooms to researchers using it to choose study sites or um, college professors that are using you know able to use real data to teach their students about stream ecology and lake ecology instead of just you know using a made-up data set or taking something from that isn't local to Michigan um, it's it's a really valuable and of course the state uses it for tracking water quality all around the state. So um, thank you for putting the time in and going out and doing it. I, I know it's a lot of fun, but sometimes it feels like, oh, there's so many other things we're trying to do in, in life, but um, it's really appreciated all of the work that you do.